Lord, well, thank you. Um, two, two sentences. Um, Mr. Cat was in the audience. Dr. Butt was on the stage. Put it another way, second sentence. Um, it's the difference between a record of the plays that Mr. Cat has attended and a record of the plays that Dr. Butt has appeared in. That, we hope, encapsulates what we say is the, the the essential differentiating, di distinguishing feature uh, between this case and the case of Cat when it comes to engagement of Oscar Lake One. Um, so, the theatre is a public place. Um, the fact that Mr. Cat is in the audience, anyone can see that. Um, the issue then becomes the creation of a record. So moving to Article 8.2, um, and it's our, of course our, our position that even if Article 8.1 is engaged, it, that doesn't matter because Article 8.2 is, is nevertheless satisfied um, on, on the authority of CAT um, in essence. So it's, um, it's paragraphs 8 to 12 of Lord Sumption's speech in CAT. That's in relation to in accordance with the law, forgive me. Um, so two, two limbs of Article 8 do have to be satisfied. Is the interference, if there is one, in accordance with the law? Is it proportionate? Um, so dealing with in accordance with the law first, we say, yes, it is in accordance with the law because um, the Data Protection Act um, adequately and sufficiently regulates um, the processing of personal data by, by the Home Office. Um, a key submission in relation to this, uh, as recognised correctly in our submission by, by the judge, um, the authorities that Malena Frem relies on in relation to secret surveillance are not relevant. Um, the Strasbourg Court has fashioned a, a strand of jurisprudence um, in the Article 8 context to deal with cases involving secret surveillance, uh, covert listening devices, um, eavesdropping, interception of communications and so on, um, because the subjects of that surveillance will not know about it, that's the whole point, and can't be told about it because that would defeat the purpose. Um, so in that context there's a, a line of Strasbourg jurisprudence which um, requires um, additional measures in terms of the foreseeability of the type of surveillance or interception that may be undertaken. Um, but that line of authority um, is, is confined to that context. Um, and in away from the, the secret secret operations, um, it, it's, it's different authority. Um, and if I could just take you, take uh, your lordship's relationship to the Uzan case that we looked at yesterday, which is at Authorities Bundle 4, tab 90, tab 90, 9-0. While we found that, I did notice, Mr. Sanders, that the policy itself, sorry, the, the guidance at page 4 in the main document, says explicitly the prevent program must not involve any covert activity against people or communities. Quite explicitly. And if it's right that we read the specific page four of the main guide.
guidance note. If we are right to read the specific guidance to speakers' universities with the main guidance, well, that would seem to be the thrust of the overall approach. Am I wrong? Um, the as in nothing could be done in support of prevent uh, confidentially. And in, in my submission, that's, that's, that couldn't be right. What, what that's a reference to is, is the prevent strategy, yeah. and the different parts of the prevent strategy to do with the channel program where people at risk of radicalization are the subject of referrals and so on. Um, it, it is part of the strategy that um, the the, the prevent strategy is not to be um, administered covertly and is not to involve spying. Um, uh, what the extremism analysis unit is doing in research and analysis uh, may assist with the prevent program and with the development of prevent policy. It is not an instance of um, the, the prevent strategy being administered. Um, that, the, the passage you've read out, my Lord, certainly doesn't mean that everything to do with prevent has to happen um, openly. Well, it doesn't say that, but it simply says it's not covert activity. Correct. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not clear if the logic's driving at a suggestion that the research done on Dr. Butler's covert activity, or... But it, it, if we, once we get to the realm of the suggestion that this is directed surveillance, mm -hmm. that the activity involved in the EAU advice about speakers is in some way surveillance. Mm. It seems to me that would be in conflict with the overall approach under the uh, PREVENT program that there should not be covert activity. Uh, I take that point. I think it's very important to, to, to keep separate the two, the two limbs of this judicial review. So the challenge in relation to Article 8 and processing by the Extremism Analysis Unit um, it, it isn't done under the prevent duty guidance. Um, no, no, I understand. It, it isn't confined to higher education and, and, and so on. So I, so I take your, your lordship's point. I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't myself pl place any weight on that in, in terms of any of the, the submissions that I. Let's begin it then. I seem to leave it, leave it to uh, to Jeff. Um, so the, does your lordship have the, the Uzon case? Tab 90. Tab 90. Um, so this is the, it involves a form of covert surveillance, um, so use of a GPS <coughs> tracking device attached to a car. And if I could just take the notice, it's first to paragraph 52, um, where is essentially the, the, the finding about engagement of our first one. In the court's view, GPS surveillance is by its very nature to be distinguished from other methods of visual and acoustical surveillance, which are, as a rule, more susceptible of interfering with a person's rights with respect to private life because they disclose more information on a person's conduct, opinions, or feelings. As in regard to the principles established in its case law, it nevertheless finds the above mentioned factors sufficient to conclude that the applicant's observation by GPS in the circumstances and the processing and use of the data obtained thereby in the manner described above amounted to an interference with his private life as protected by Article 8.1. So that's the, the, the finding as to what was an issue here and the fact that Article 8.1 is engaged. Um, and then I just want to take your lordships to paragraph 65 to 66, where there's a consideration of, of what's required in relation to the um, in accordance with the law uh, sublimit of Article 8.2. Um, <clears throat> so 65, as to the law's foreseeability and its compliance with the rule of law, the court notes at the outset that in his submissions the applicant strongly relied on the minimum safeguards which are to be set out in statute law in order to avoid abuses as developed by the court in the context of applications concerning the interception of telecommunications. According to these principles, the nature of the offences which may give rise to an interception order, a definition of the categories of people liable to have their communications monitored, a limit on the duration of such monitoring, the procedure to be followed for examining, using and storing the data obtained, the precautions to be taken in communicating the data to other parties, and the circumstances in which data obtained may or must be erased, or the record destroyed, has to be defined in statute law. And those are known as the, the Weber um, conditions. Um, and then 66, while the court is not barred from gaining inspiration from these principles, it finds that these rather strict standards set up and applied in the specific context of surveillance of tele telecommunication movements in public places 
and thus a measure which must be considered to interfere less with the private life of the person concerned than the interception of his or her tele telephone conversations. It will therefore apply the more general principles and adequate protection against arbitrary interference with Article 8 rights as summarised above. So the, the, the point here is that in the secret surveillance and interception context, the requirements of in accordance with the law under Article 8 1 are stricter. Um, first, because more intrusive. Secondly, because of the difficulty of the individual finding out about it. Um, away from that context, as in this case, the requirements are less strict. Uh, and we rely on that um, in conjunction with CAT to support the, the proposition that the, the Data Protection Act um, is sufficient for these purposes. What about the run of authority? which says that people must have sufficient notice of their of, of, of they, that sufficient notice of what's happened in order to exercise their rights. Well, my lord, there, there isn't a run of authority on, on that. It's been portrayed in that way by my learned friend. Uh, I join issue with him on that. There, there is no suggestion that in order to comply with Article 8, an individual must be notified on every occasion where their, their personal data are well, posted. Do you want to comment on the cases where it does show that? Even uh, though just a number of cases. <laughs> He referred us to some cases away from away in the in the secret surveillance and interception context where there are these more these stricter requirements. There's no need for those requirements in this case because any individual can make a subject access request. Um, so in relation to um, in accordance with the law on enforceability and so on, it's obviously known that the Home Office is a registered data controller um, and is subject to the, to the Data Protection Act. Um, the establishment of the EAU itself as a, as a team within the Home Office was made public in March 2015 in the Home Secretary's speech. Uh, it was referred to in the press notice and also elaborated on in, in the um, counter-extremism strategy doc document of October 2015. Um, the, the Home Office um, had an entry in the Data Protection Register uh, describing the type of da data processing that it does. I, I won't take you to it, but it's in, the, it's in Bundle 2 at B100. It's obviously publicly known that the Home Office has a Minister of State for Countering Extremism. That's, what, that's a, po a policy remit uh, of the Home Office. It has a, a, a published information strategy, which is in bundle two at B62. B62? B62, my lord, yes. Strategy is that? It's, a, it's called the information strategy, so it's just uh, general information about the, the way in which uh, information is handled, or is at the time handled by the Home Office. Um, and it has a document which is, which would now be called a privacy notice, but at the time was known as an information charter, um, which is at B90. Um, as, in, as in the CAT case, in my submission, these uh, restrictions, these regulations are sufficient for the purposes of satisfying the in accordance with the law memo of Article 8.2. Um, as I said, I think the end, I'm not sure that uh, Mr. Ben, uh, 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 ben um, ever suggested that once you get to the data, to correct inaccuracies and what you can do with, with the information you've got. If, uh, on this aspect, I think he very much relied on the ability to know what your rights were so that you should be notified. Now, one point you've made about that so far is that the data protection can't come in and tell you, look, I've sent an email in Google. 
Tequila. Um, with your making more general pledges, will there simply be no, in any event, will there simply be no obligation as a matter of general rules of constraints? Well, these rules to notify people in these circumstances. As a matter of Article, two, Article 8, correct. Um, under the Data Protection Act, uh, which doesn't, which is obviously linked to Article 8 and it protects privacy interests and so on, the first data protection principle under the 98 Act was uh, that processing of personal data should be fair and lawful. Uh, and then it, under that Act, um, there are provisions as to what needs to be uh, notified to um, data subjects. Um, and it's generally recognised um, that having a privacy notice um, being on the, the register of registered data controllers um, advertised right, a second thing, we'll get through the in quite fast Sorry. Uh, so the first principle uh, is that um, it's to be fair and what I, I haven't looked at it it's to be fair and lawful fair and lawful that was uh, so that's the first principle yes and then which are, there are various provisions dealing with what to be notified the data subject yes yeah, so in order to be fair and lawful, certain conditions have to be fulfilled, and then there is there is elaboration on what's required in terms of notification. Right. Um, and do you, and, and, and what, um, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, it, it, those provisions recognise that there's no need to notify a data subject if it will involve disproportionate effort, um, and. say when you do have to notify data subjects about anything. So, well, I, I can take your Lordship to, to, to look at them. Well, I just asked them whether they were... Yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's dealt with, it, it's in, it's dealt with in, in Schedule 1. Um, well, when you do have to notify. Yes. Should we just have a quick look at that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so it's Authorities Bundle 1. So if I just start at um, section four. And subsection four. Um, it is the duty of the data controller to comply with the data protection principles um, and then they're found in as, as set out se section 4.1 part 1 of schedule 1 I have been through this recently just looking for is there anything else going on I seem to remember it yes um, so it's at page uh, 130 of the bundle the pagination at the top Looking at um, the interpretive part of one, so it's um, yeah, 130, sorry, that's the one. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So personal data shall be processed fairly and lawfully, and in particular shall not be processed unless A, at least one of the conditions in Schedule 2 is met, and B, in the case of sensitive personal data, at least one of the conditions in Schedule 3 is also met. Um, and so then turning to part two of the schedule. Yes. And then paragraph two of part two. So it's at the bottom of page AB133. Subject to paragraph three, for the purposes of the first principle, personal data are not to be treated as processed fairly unless case of data obtained from the data subject, the data controller ensures as far as practicable that the data subject has, is provided with or has made readily available to him the information specified in subparagraph 3. And in any other case, the data controller ensures so far as practicable 
that before the relevant time or as soon as practicable after that time, the data subject has, is provided with, or has more, made readily available to him the information specified in subparagraph 3. Uh, and then the information referred to in subparagraph 1 is as follows, namely the identity of the data controller, that he has nominated representative, the purpose or purposes for which the data are intended to be processed, and any further information which is necessary on the above the circumstances. And then this is subject to paragraph 3, so further down the page. So what is the relevant time? Uh, that's de defined in, in 2, in subparagraph 2. So just pausing there, I don't understand this. At the moment when the Home Office, or you whoever, passes information concerning somebody in this first position to a present coordinator, that is, falls within a relevant time. Is that, is that right under 2B? In case where that, that would disclose to those other individuals that are envisaged, if they are in fact disclosed, the time when they're disclosed, is that right? Um, yes, but 2A, uh, the time when the data controller first processes the data, that's processing includes uh, simply stored, storing it, having it on a computer. Um, so yeah, acquiring. Know, but at the, at the latest, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of a situation when, when somebody's been identified as a potential extremist. The um, department, through EAU, you know, whatever it may be, learns that there's an event going on that they're concerned about. And as part of the information given, let's assume it's part of the information given to the, um, the prevent coordinator, the name of the extremist who's attending the meeting is passed on. Am I right in thinking that at that point, an obligation to disclose that matter? or the various matters that are relevant, has to be given to the data subject? Well, no, because the subject to paragraph 3. Um, paragraph 3.1b does not apply. There are either of the primary conditions <laughs> conditions in subparagraph 2, together with such further conditions and matrix described in section 6, in order to are met. And the primary conditions we refer to in subparagraph 1 are that the provision of that information would involve a disproportionate deficit. Well, that's a matter to be decided. Well, it's not because Dr. Butt hasn't claimed a breach of the first data protection principle. No, no he hasn't claimed that. I'm just trying to. But he could say, under, he could say, he hasn't said it here, he could say under the Data Protection Act, it's not disproportionate and you should tell me. You should have told me. Yes. He could say that. Yes. Could have done. He, he didn't. Is that, is that the provision you rely upon? 3 to uh, three, two B, 3 to A. Well, the issue is, it, it is the processing in accordance with the law? Um, and for, for these purposes, in my submission, it's sufficient that there is the Data Protection Act in place uh, and the Home Office. I know that's your submission. Complies with and I've got, we've got that submission. I'm just trying to see whether, if we take the other side's submission, there's an answer to that particular point. That's what I'm trying to do. I understand what your submission is, and that may or may not be sufficient. Yes, so. so so I'm trying to you know, look at it through somebody else's eyes. Yes, if you're an advocate, caught, it's not always easy. If you're caught by the provisions of the Act, if the Act is what you rely on, then you have to show why under the Act the obligations don't arise. That, that's my understanding of what you've been saying. Um, you look as if I've got it wrong, and I'd rather be told now than later. <laughs> but um, if the obligations under the Act arise, yes. the disapplication. Uh, represented by uh, paragraph 3 mm. has to be explained. Yes. Now, if the disapplication is involved disproportionate effort, I understand that. Yes. I think that was my Lord's question. Yeah, no, that exactly. So, I mean, so the point is you... Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look through Dr. Bat's, mm. Bat's eyes. You know, as an advocate, it's not easy to do that with this, but, you know, that's what judges we have to try to look at it through everybody's eyes. Uh, but you know, looking it through through the eyes of somebody in his position, one of his complaints is, I didn't know, and I wanted to know. I do know now, he says, but I mean, you know, I didn't know for quite a time. So I'm trying to look at that and to see whether um, this uh, deals with that. And indeed, some of the Strasbourg jurisprudence does deal with that. I know you say it's all to do with 
survey, it's a secrecy and so on, but it deals with the issue of are the rights that you've got reasonably accessible to you, which seems to be a, quite a sensible proposition of the national law. And, and, and so this is very helpful in identifying what the rights of a data subject are. And so, as I understand it, your answer is to say um, that the Act itself lays down circumstances in which it is reasonable to notify you. And um, the law doesn't require anything more than that. Nor the, I mean, I'm just trying to articulate your answer to his point, which no doubt will be a reply to. Uh, but is that, is that the answer, that the Act itself lays down what would, what would be the reasonable circumstances in which you'll be notified, and in reasonable circumstances, yes, you'll be notified. Oh, yes, and, That's and, it. and it's in accordance with the law, because this is the law. I understand. In, in accordance. And, and the point is, you, the, the two separate instances of processing. Yes. The first is receipt of this information from student rights about two events. We say to have notified everyone each time, each time it's, it's recorded that there's been a an event or a speaker to notify each person on every occasion we are now processing your personal data because we're, we're recording you would be disproportionate. The second time, post press release, uh, the processing, it does, doesn't need to be notified no, to Dr. because it's going to be provided that. with it. Of course, any concern with the position prior to having the information at all. Hmm. Uh, and, um, well, we don't, it's not part of this case decide what is disproportionate or not disproportionate on any particular facts. I think what we're concerned about is whether or not under the, the law that's relied upon, which is the DPA, there are in fact provisions enabling sufficient access to the relief. That's what we're concerned about. Oh, yes. uh, and um, the, the provisions I've taken to you um, set out implementing the then uh, data Protection Directive, um, what was required. Um, and Article 8 doesn't require any more than that, and there's no, there's no authority to suggest that it does. Understood. Um, Thank you. Could I ask one follow-up question? I quite follow that as each piece of information comes in and recorded, that is processing, and therefore it would, I could see the argument that it's disproportionate to say you've got to tell everybody every time a new piece of information comes. It, here we have two, we may have 20 or 50. However, if you get to the point of reaching a conclusion about an individual and communicating, I don't think it probably is to a third party because probably the prevent coordinators are legally servants of the Home Secretary in the way that EAU are, but let's set that aside. Whether or not he, that prevent coordinator is a third party if you get to the point of communicating, look, here's a risk, what will be disproportionate about informing the subject at the same time? It would depend on the circumstances. Really. Mm -hmm. um, the, obviously, the proportionality um, test isn't, it's just, isn't solely about administrative inconvenience. It's got to be mm -hmm. proportioned proportional to the, the nature of the information um, <coughs> and the interference. Yeah, it's the interference and, and that would be involved in, in, in notifying everyone within a particular within a particular category. Um, so but it, it's not part of Dr. Butt's case that um, the first data protection principle has been breached. Um, what matters Well yeah, it's not an issue in these proceedings. No. Not an issue That's in this case. Not an issue. His, his claim is that the processing uh, interfered with his Article 8 rights uh, and wasn't in accordance with the law and wasn't justified. And my response is it was A, it didn't engage his Article 8 rights, but if it did, the processing was in accordance with the law, subject to the Data Protection Act. Um, the, the Information Commissioner ha has oversight over, over government departments and their processes irrespective of individual complaints. Um, there is a system in place. It's in accordance with the law. Um, so, no, but I think I probably ought to rise. I, I don't like to interrupt my friend. Our yeah. case is under Article 8. It's not under the Data Protection Act. Yeah. However, we say as a matter of the Data Protector, sorry, as a matter of Article 8, there is a duty to notify somebody of the fact that their private information is being processed. 
in order for them to exercise their rights under Article 8 or under domestic law. If, the, if what the, the respondent is relying upon is the disproportionate nature of uh, the duty under the Data Protection Act, then it is for them to show that it would have been disproportionate. I don't because otherwise... Okay. I don't, right, we'll have your chance for reply. Thank you. I, I, just, I, don't just think that's the, I don't think that's the way that the response to is articulated. The way it's, the response is articulated is to say that under, under Article 8.2, there are two matters, which is one, whether or not, obviously, <coughs> it's a legitimate purpose that's not being challenged. If it is, whether it's in accordance with the law, uh, and if it's proportionate. Uh, and um, uh, what's being said is that as in accordance with the law is concerned, uh, the Data Protection Act provides all the certainty and relief you need, and indeed contains provisions. Been put. I just thought it'd be better if I made it clear what our case was, yes. and then Frank can respond to my case rather than the case he thinks is responsible. Well, I, I don't think he's uh, right. I, I understand. I think it's what uh, you're making. Uh, okay, uh, on Article Eight, it's our submission that the authorities my learned friend relies on to um, to support the submission that there's a notification requirement do not support that submission. Uh, there's no case in this type of context away from secret surveillance and interception, um, it, involving this type of information, where it said that, 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 that non-notification is a breach of Article 8. So the safeguards that are available to Dr. Bart is he could make a subject access request to the to the Home Office, um, or anyone. Um, the, the Information Commissioner could receive a complaint. Could also has a general supervisory function. Uh, claims can be made under the Data, Data Protection Act. Um, the internal policies um, that the judge did not place weight on. We we accept that because they're not published, we say they do provide an additional safeguard um, and, a, and a relevant, uh, albeit marginally. Would you say the judge should have relied on them? There was no need to. No doubt you invited him to. But he, I've got the point of principle. I see that you would presumably refer him to them. Yes. But he said they were not legitimately, could, you could not legitimately rely upon them because they were not public they were private. Yes, so, that, so there's a line of authority, again, in the surveillance and interception context, where in order to comply with Article 8.1, reliance can be placed on what are called below the waterline um, policies. So MI5, for example, um, has um, a set of arrangements, set of policies about w what it will do. It doesn't publish them, but their existence goes towards the satisfaction of, of Article 8.1. Um, I didn't need to get into that because this isn't security and intelligence context. But in, in, uh, in the Svens case, the, the uh, the private policies, they go to the question of what proportionality? Um, they, they go to, they also go to in accordance with the law, so they, no, they go to fulfilling um, the foreseeability um, in, in the sense that something exists and then the, the, the um, now the um, Investigatory Powers Commissioner has oversight of that, so that it just sort of adds to the the compliance, um, but it's not it's not relevant here because this isn't the security and intelligence context. Okay. So I'm going to put here, you don't rely upon the, the, the internal policies because they're not relevant, because they're not necessary. They're not necessary. Um, So I rely on what's made public, 
which are taken to those ships too. Can I take you to your lordship to lay ship to um, the Big Brother Watch decision, which is in Authorities Bundle 6? What point are we on now? Uh, so this is the, the same point of the notification. And it was a, a challenge to various aspects of the surveillance uh, apparatus um, in this jurisdiction. And if I could just start at uh, paragraph 211. outlining what the um, report of the European Commission for Democracy through Law, the Venice Commission on the Democratic Oversight of Signals Intelligence Agencies, had said in relation to um, notification. Uh, I'll just invite your worship to relate it to me. 211-213. Yes, so similarly, the Commission observed that the notification of the subject of surveillance is not an absolute requirement of Article 8 of the Convention. In this regard, a general complaint procedure for an independent oversight body to compensate for non notification. And then, if I could just take you to jump, jump ahead to page paragraph 310. So it's accepted that there can't be notification during the surveillance. Um, then the issue here is, well, should there be no automatic notification after the surveillance has been terminated? Um, as regards the third stage, after the surveillance has been terminated, the question of subsequent notification of surveillance notice is inextricably linked to the effectiveness of remedies before the courts and hence to the existence of effective safeguards against the abuse of monitoring power. It is in principle little scope for recourse to the courts by the individual concerned unless the latter is advised the measures taken without his or her knowledge unless they can challenge the legality of the effectiveness. Or, in the alternative, unless any person who suspects that he or she has been subject to surveillance can apply to courts whose jurisdiction does not depend on notification to the surveillance subject of the measures taken. So this, the second part of that, and this is my learned friend's submission, is that in this jurisdiction, the fact that if you suspect that you may have been subject to surveillance, you can complain to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal is sufficient. Exactly the same applies here. If you suspect that the Home Office uh, counter-extremism unit may be processing your personal data, you can put in a subject access request. It's exactly as effective. And there's no notification on either side. Can you just again tell us the, the relevant section in the data protection? Section 7 is subject access requests. Mr. 
some, this is part of that logic there, that notification um, cannot be given during the process, and also that even giving it at the end, um, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of NCND complications that come from this. Um, so in establishing the proportionality of the safeguards for true surveillance cases, you would say this is not one of them. One has to bear in mind the consequences of a notification process even at the end. I think there are other passages in European cases we saw yesterday to that effect. So is it, a, is it an answer to this, where it's not surveillance and where it's not private information? The only reason Article 8.1 is engaged is because the collation and the use to which it's got to be sure. The, the downside to notification wouldn't arise because you're not telling someone who's subject to surveillance in such a way that might compromise his investigation or alert others or breach NCND. I, I mean, I, I understand the, the logic of that, but the, the question is as, as to the, the strength of jurisprudence and as to whether Article 8 imposes a notification requirement. Um, you simply say it doesn't because here's a... Well, it, it will depend on, on the circumstances and it will depend on the nature of, of, of the information, but there is no general notification requirement. Um, so in the, as I've said, in the, the secret surveillance, secret interception sphere, there are the Weber um, conditions. Um, and then it will, it will depend on, on the case. Um, that in, in my suspicion, in this case, Bearing in mind the approach taken by the, the European Court to saying, well, if you suspect something's happened, you can go to the IPT and that's enough. It's exact, the same logic applies here. You suspect that the Home Office is processing your data, you can make a subject access request and you can find out. Um, because what, what one has to otherwise find is a positive obligation to notify, um, and without that, there's a breach of Article 8. And in my suspicion, there's, there's, no, there's no authority for that. Um, my learned friend referred yesterday to the um, Christian Institute case. Um, that case wasn't to do with notification of the fact that processing is taking place, as here. It's to do with, A, much more sensitive uh, information about children, and then it's, it's being shared more widely. So in that context, Article 8.2 may require notification. But in the context of the type of information <coughs> involved in this case, in my suspicion, there, there's no authority to say that there's a notification requirement under Article 8.2. Right. Moving on to Proportionality, so the, the second sublim of Article 82. Apologies, I just need to mention one point. The, the judge, of course, made a finding of, of fact that, um, that Dr. Buck could readily contemplate that the, the Home Office was processing his personal data. Um, and we say that that's relevant, it's, it's not open to this court to, to reverse that. So you could reasonably contemplate that the Home Office? Met might be processing his, his personal data and that he could, um, if he made a subject access request, he could he could find out if it was. What paragraph is that of the judgment? Um, I'll, 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 I'll find out. I don't have it in my head. Um, So, proportionality, and taking this much, much more um, quickly, um, the, the points we emphasize here are, is to the extent, 250, 250, thank you. Thank you very much. The, in relation to proportionality, of course, the points we emphasize are the, the interference um, involved in the fact that um, information about public speeches is being looked at, stored by the Home Office, is, is minimal. The, 
aim of the Home Office in considering the information is a legitimate aim. What is the second thing? Uh, yes, un under proportionality. The aim, which is uh, prevention of, of um, being induced into terrorism. Well, the, the aim may be slightly more sophisticated than that. The aim is understanding extremism, researching it, and then fulfilling the, the functions that are set out in Mr. Willis's um, statement in terms of what, what the extreme, extremism analysis unit aims to do. So it's, it's, not, as, it's not as hard to edge as preventing, preventing extremism. It's, I mean, that's the, the ultimate goal. But it's, it's, in my submission, it's, it's um, self-evidently an Article 82 interest. Um, and then the, the ends in our submission justify the means. Is that the third? Yes. What does that mean? Well, the, what's being done and assessing the nature of what's being done in, in the sense that some information about uh, a, a lecture that uh, Dr. Button has given is being stored and looked at, minimal interference, is that justified by the overall objective of uh, protecting the country from extremism and individuals from radicalization and being drawn into terrorism? Um, and can I just give you the, the references to the to the passages in CAT and the W and Health Secretary case that we, that we say are relevant? Um, so in relation to CAT, there's the speech of Lord Sumption at paragraphs 8, 11 to 14, 26 to 33, and 45. 45? 45. And that's at, at Authority Tunnel 2, tab 32. Um, and then the W case, um, it's uh, Judgment of Lord Dyson, paragraph 79 to 88. Um, so which, where, which bundle is that in? A, authorities Bundle 3, tab 65. I think the reference, the reference to CAT was what authorities bundle three also, is it? You said two, I think. Uh, two, or tab 32 is what oh, I was 32, saying. that's right. These are all about, this is all about the data protection act. No, my lord, that's, it's about proportionality. Uh, well, 
it's, it's all of it in accordance with the law. I talk about the Kerry Cat case, 11 to 14, in accordance with the law. Then we get on to proportionality after that. Oh, I pl uh, it may be that I've, give, I've given you my in accordance with the law twice. Um, apologies if, that, if that's the case. 6 to 32, that is just proportionality. Well, then, before you do that, I just want to ask you uh, 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 once more with you on one thing. The judge found that there was not surveillance. He said it wasn't sufficiently systematic or pesky, whatever it may be. Um, is that a finding of fact? Well, I think uh, what amounts to whether, whether an activity does or does not amount to surveillance, I suppose it's a matter of ordinary English. Sounds like a question of fact. Uh, well obviously if it is, then it's not something you should be interfering with unless we can discuss it each other and come to that conclusion. If it's a question of mixed fact and law, that may be different. It doesn't sound as it doesn't sound at the moment to me like a pure question of law. No, I, w I would submit it's, it's mixed fact and law because the, the question is the, the, the factual question about what is happening and then the, the legal question about whether that amounts to surveillance for the purposes of, of RIPA. Um, and if it's a question of mixed fact and law, what is our, what is our review function? Well, it would be, it would be to identify whether um, there's an error of law in terms of the judge's um, adumbration of test and, and whether he felt it was met. Um, so it's, it, I mean, essentially, it's, it's just a question of ordinary, ordinary English and looking, giving you some claim on the internet that he surveys. What do you say about that? That's correct. You say he applied the correct principle? Yes. Before I come to that, can I just sweep up my, uh, the, the outstanding cases on Article 8? So, my learned friend referred to the Hewitt and Harmon decision, which is at Authorities Bundle 6, uh, tab 118. I don't need to take you to it, I'll, I'll just deal with these, I hope, very, very briefly. So, this was. Um, um, the, there was a, a former MI5 officer, Kathy Masseter, who um, leaked or um, disclosed information suggesting that uh, MI5 had information, was holding information about um, Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt. Um, they, they made an application to Strasbourg. Um, the decision is a decision of the Commission, um, and essentially it's, it's saying it's, it's arguable. I mean, it was settled because it was it was consistent with other cases that uh, MI5 holding files um, engaged Article 8, um, and there wasn't at that time uh, an in accordance with the law basis for that um, because of the, the timing of the um, Security Service Act coming into force. Um, my learned friends uh, relied on this and suggested it was authority for the proposition that opening a file on someone engages their Article 8 rights. Um, and that's n simply not what the case says. The, it, it's clear when one reads the decision that the information <coughs> held was private information. It wasn't information about what Ms. Uh, Harmon and Ms. Hewitt had been doing in the public domain or in the House of Commons or what have you. It was, it, there were, there had been interception of telephone that they'd been party to. Um, there were surveillance reports. 
there was private information. And that's what engaged Article 8. My learned friend suggested you open a file with someone, you engage Article 8, and it's not simply not right. It, it depends on reasonable expectation of privacy and what the nature of the information is. Um, reference to Google Spain and the NT1 litigation, in my submission, that's irrelevant. Um, if and when it gets to a point where Dr. Buck wants to say you, you should now delete this information, that he can pursue that at the time. The, the issue here is whether or not the processing in the first instance was lawful, um, not, not retention. Um, so the very question is whether the acquisition committee, right? whether it's retention? It's the, it's the acquisition and the, and the processing at the time of the material. Um, if it were retained for 20, 30, 40 years, then there might be an issue about the right to be forgotten. There might be an issue about whether it should still be retained. But that's the, the issue on this claim is as, to, is as to whether it was lawful to have it in the first place and to do what was done with it in the first place. Um, my learned friend's reliance on the uh, Cliff Richard decision. Um, the issue there was disclosure to the wider world of the fact of this police investigation, which is not um, equivalent to um, simply s storing and processing without publishing um, information. I appreciate there's a point about the press notice, which is being dealt with. Yeah. It is not part of this case. If that was a breach of Article 8, then that will be dealt with in that limb of the claim. But the concern here is the processing by the EAU per se. One ingredient of the case that was referred to was uh, that the material was acquired with a view to it being used where necessary for purpose in the future to employ the employees. Well, my understanding of, of his submission in relation to the Cliff Richard case was that, the, that there's an element of stigma in being under police yes, investigation and that there would be an ele element of stigma in, in being the subject of consideration by the extremism analysis unit. Um, but in that case, and the, the, the judgment in that case was to the effect that the, the stigma arises because, um, again, bearing in mind the way it was broadcast and publicised and so, and so on, um, it, people wouldn't understand that there hadn't been a charge and that uh, Sir Cliff was innocent until proven guilty and and so on. So it's, it's a very different factual matrix um, in terms of that being his private information. No, I, the only thing I was picking up when you said the complaint here is about, um, is about the storing and processing and not publication. Yes. And the only point I was making here is what it's worth, and I think it, go, it goes to your one point which is one of the ingredients that's relied upon uh, by uh, the uh, panelists here, is that part of the purposes of acquiring and retaining this information, and it is retained for this purpose, uh, is for the purpose of being deployed in the future where appropriate an event it might take place. Well, I, I mean, as described in Mr. Willis's statement, yes, yeah, so a pro it, it, the information may be communicated to a prevent coordinator who might raise it who would then pass it on? Uh, well, not pass it on, but, but raise it with, um, I mean, it's described in the witness statement as to, as to how the process works. Um, but certainly not um, anything akin to what happened to in the Cliff Richard case. Well, I think you seem to be a fact Yes. I mean, th these, it's fact sensitive. Uh, the, the Christian Institute case, which I've touched on, um, was much more sensitive information about much um, private information about children going to uh, family life considerations. Um, 
And finally, the, the Telly 2 stroke Watson litigation um, was simply concerned with the requirements of a directive in relation to intrusive um, surveillance of electronic communications. And we say it's, it, there's nothing in there that's relevant to Article 8. Ripper, um, and, and taking this as, as quickly as I can, I just need to take your Lordship's, your Ladyship's well to the, to the legislation, um, and then to one authority. Um, volume one, so it's authority funded volume one, tab 14. Under one tab fourteen. Yes. Uh, so section forty eight, subsection two. Just to make the point that here that 48.2 is not a definition of surveillance, um, and I'll take you to the authority for this, it is surveillance includes. Um, it's not an exhaustive definition, there's no question of having to, having to satisfy one of these or satisfying. While we're in this tab, if I could just also highlight section 80. Yes. And so th this is the provision which um, tells us that the that the Ripper regime is essentially a permissive regime, um, so that it provides a lawful basis for authority for um, conduct, whether it's interception or surveillance, or use of a covert human intelligence source, which may, without this legal basis, which may um, interfere with and breach Article 8. Um, but the fact that something amounts to surveillance and hasn't been authorised under a directive of surveillance authorisation doesn't mean it's unlawful. Funnel 2 at tab 34, there's a decision of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal in a case that's called Re a Complaint of Surveillance. Who was the president at this time? No. Which tab? Uh, tab 34. I think the Vice President might be Mr. Justice Burton. 
Yes, I think that's right. Um, and as I was there, I, <laughs> I think it was St. John Mummery. Mummery. But I'm, I may have misremembered that. Um, so paragraph three is just the point that um, surveillance is, a, is an ordinary English word. Um, and just because something meets the, one of those conditions in uh, section 48 doesn't mean it's surveillance. And then that's, that's developed at paragraphs 12 to 14. Forty-two to forty-three. It's twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and then forty-two, forty-three, and then paragraph forty-six simply confirms the point about it being a permissive regime and then forty six. Forty six. say that the, the judge was correct um, in his finding that there was no surveillance in this case. Um, I won't go through this. We also say that even if there was surveillance, it wasn't directed, didn't meet the conditions for di being directed surveillance, and in any event, as we are agreed, there was no scope for obtaining a directed surveillance authorization. point is that either Dr. Butt is successful under Article 8, in which case this, this adds nothing, or he's unsuccessful under Article 8, in which case this adds nothing. It's, a, it's an entirely, uh, it's, a, it's a red herring. That's the, the first two grounds, so grounds four and five. And if I could turn now to grounds one, two, and three, and the, the guidance, so moving away from the article eight and data processing. Um, and I, I will take this uh, as quickly as I can, and I'm still the objective of finishing <laughs> this afternoon. Um, the, the, the legislation itself, the premise of the legislation is in our submission quite clear that, that there's a, a parliamentary recognition that um, external speakers on university campuses um, may, um, what they say, may be capable of drawing uh, people into terrorism. Uh, and therefore, that's something that the prevent duty, uh, that's a place where the prevent duty can and should bite. Um, there wouldn't be the provisions about freedom of, of speech on, in higher educa <coughs> education institutions or further education institutions unless it was clearly contemplated that the prevent duty guidance would, would operate in this area. Um, we say it's clear from the scheme of the Act that... Um, the relevant provisions, section 26 onwards, are concerned with risk, um, and it's simply not open to the claimant to say that what's said on universities isn't capable of drawing people into, into terrorism. Um, that's, that's the premise of, of, 
the legislation. Um, I didn't hear what you said before. The board. Uh, apologies, my lady. And it's, um, not open to it's not open to the claimant to say that um, speeches on university campuses um, are not capable of drawing people into terrorism. Well, the suggestion is that um, non-violent extremism um, can't draw people into terrorism. Um, and then there's, there's movement to and fro from, from that position. Um, but, but in my submission, it's quite plain from the legislation um, the proposition that um, non-violent extremism can lead to radicalization and, draw, and lead to someone being drawn into terrorism. Not necessarily. Um, may not be sufficient either. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an area where the prevent duty can and should bite. So importantly, the prevent duty under section 26, so the duty to have due regard to the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism, coexists with other duties that higher education institutions are under. So there is the duty under section 43, uh, the Education Number 2 Act 1986, um, to ensure freedom of speech. Um, there's the duty under section 6 of the Human Rights Act to not act incompatibly with convention rights. Uh, and then there are duties under the Equalities Act not to discriminate and to um, comply with the public sector equality duty. What Section 26 does is require a decision maker deciding whether or not to allow um, an event to go ahead on a, on a university to have due regard to one consideration um, and then there's an obligation to have regard to the guidance on how to do that. So any decision maker is not simply going to address that one consideration and take, they must obviously take into account all relevant considerations, not take into account any irrelevant considerations, and they must comply with all duties that they are under. The obligation under Section 26 to have due regard is the harder of the obligations. Um, and then there's, under Section 29, the softer ancillary obligation to have regard to the guidance. There's then a a somewhat firmer obligation to also have particular regard to um, the Section 43, the 1986 Act duty, and to ensure freedom of speech. So Section 26 and compliance with Section 26 is about process, not outcomes. And what the guidance does is, is, is offer a guide to how to go about paying due regard to the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. So it's about one factor, but any decision maker will have other factors to take into account um, at the same time. Under Section 29, uh, the Home Secretary is not uh, either obliged or empowered to issue guidance about how to balance um, competing factors or how to comply with competing duties. All she or now he can do is provide guidance on how to have due regard to the need to avoid people being drawn, drawn into terrorism. So it's, it's quite possible 
in, in a given case for section 26 to point in one direction and for another consideration to point in another direction. And what the legislation does is require the decision maker to go through a certain deliberative process in coming to the decision. But the final outcome, the final balance, is for the decision maker. Um, neither Section 26 nor the guidance compels particular outcomes. This is, becomes relevant to what it means to follow the guidance. Um, because following the guidance doesn't mean um, coming to any particular outcome. It means having regard to what the guidance says about how to have due regard to this consideration. Um, so doing that and coming to a different conclusion doesn't mean that the guidance hasn't been, regard hasn't been had to the guidance. There's a bit of a confusing mix of due regard, so what regard... This, what this submission regard. seems to amount to is uh, you must be guided by this guidance, but you must ignore it. No, not at all. Where appropriate. Um, well, that's what the judge said. The judge said exactly that. He said you must follow the guidance, uh, but if you think the guidance is wrong, you ignore it. Well, in my submission, that's, that's, that's not the right way to, to formulate it, because that doesn't mean you've ignored the guidance. That means you've, that you will have had regard to the guidance, and you will have taken that into account, and you will weigh that in the scales, and you may come to a different outcome. But that doesn't mean you've ignored it. It doesn't mean you haven't gone through the let's process. Take, let's take paragraph 11, to the bottom of skirting around it. That says, if there's a risk, and you can't mitigate it so that there's no risk, you must cancel the event. It's quite clear about what it says. And the judge said so. You, you gave a more moderated view about what he meant. And he said, well, that's not right. That's not what it says. So he rejected that position. He said it means what it says. Well, in those circumstances, if you're right, um, and um, uh, uh, where there's an insignificant risk, uh, actually, uh, both under conven the convention and under our own domestic statutes, free speech should, tr should trump, should trump um, e everything else, then they have to reject that as well. It's not, it's not qualified advice. It's quite straightforward. It's, it's, it's emphatic. Well, in, in my submission, it's, it's artificial to take two sentences of one paragraph of one of the documents that comprises this guidance um, and say that that, that, that um, mandates a particular outcome. I, I appreciate that the way in which that paragraph read by itself reads, but the effect of the guidance in my submission, taken as a whole and bearing in mind what it is requiring the decision maker to do, which is to have regard to, to a consideration, um, does not mean that the guidance is being ignored if um, an event is, is not cancelled. Well, what does it mean? You are ignored. No, it means you, you are, you're taking this into account, but there's something that, that weighs more heavily in, in the balance that means you're going ahead. I mean, it's, a, it's a standard decision-making you process. There's a distinction between that and having to follow the guidance. Well, it, it's not the type of guidance one follows in the sense of here's guidance about um, you're confronted with this. Um, so the, the cases that my learned friend refers to, so that the Let's case, uh, which is guidance to legal aid caseworkers about whether or not Article 2 might be engaged in a particular inquest, um, that contained an erroneous statement. Uh, that if it was followed, would lead the, the legal aid caseworker to come to a wrong decision, potentially. Um, and then the, the Fox case, which is guidance about framing the syllabus for a GCSE and religious studies, um, that said wrongly, if you do this, you will satisfy convention rights. Um, so in those were cases where following the guidance would lead to error. But here, one, one follows the guidance in the sense of 
how do I have particular regard to the need to uh, prevent people being drawn into terrorism? Well, how do you? Well, when it said, when it said, you must cancel the meetings in these circumstances. In what respect are you having a regard to it? What if you, you don't cancel the meeting? If you, if you don't care, how are you having a regard to that? I mean, what, what does that mean? You you consider it and you decide how much weight to attach to it. And where in the guidance does it say? Where in the guidance does it say that's what you should do? I think the guidance is guidance. If the guidance had said, "We think you should do this, but you may come to different conclusions in these circumstances," I could see that amount that could amount to guidance. But that's not what paragraph eleven says. Well, what's what is the question I'd ask? What is it that um, this paragraph eleven is said? potentially to permit or encourage or lead to? And the answer is, from Mr. Bowen, that potentially cancelling an event where um, the risk of people being drawn into terrorism cannot be um, fully mitigated might breach Article 10. Um, that, that, that's, the, that's the criticism that's made. The criticism is that if, if the guidance is truly guidance which has to be taken into account and, and followed in a specific situation, then that then then that um, would put them in breach of their Article 10 obligations. And the judge said, well, in those circumstances, you simply have to ignore it. I mean, the, the, we have to start off, Mr. Sons, with your own proposition of what it meant, which the judge rejected. You said what it meant was that um, the risk had to be insignificant, the mitigation had to be so far as could be or was proper, the degree unmitigated, the, the degree of unmitigated risk would then fall for consideration by the institution under its Section 31 duty, which is, I think, the proposition you're putting forward now. That that's what read as a whole the guide means. No, the the judge rejected that. Well, uh, can, can I leave Section 31 to one side? Because that's, that's a separate consideration in terms of what's what's the criticism of, of this guidance the criticism is that it might lead to or permit or encourage something that's incompatible with article 10 yes, the Secretary of state does not comply with his or her duty to section 31 of the no, well I, I i need to put that to one side my lord because that's a misunderstanding of section 31 3 section 31 3 is to do with not decisions about al allowing uh, an event to take place but they, that's to do with when uh, a speaker has been invited or an event is taking place, ensuring that it can go ahead without um, uh, a denial of through um, disruption. But I'll, I'll come to that because that's that's ground two, um, and the focus in, in ground one is on inquiries of the guidance. Um, and the, the claim is that paragraph 11 may lead to, permit, or encourage. Oh, I see. You're dealing with it either that or you're dealing with violence. <coughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. So we're splitting it up in that way. I understand. <coughs> I mean, I wasn't so much concerned with my sense of right. My learned friend said the same. Uh, my understanding is that we have one is the, is the guidance ultra virus, two, has, in issuing the guidance, has the Secretary of State failed to have um, regard to the Section 31, um, to, to, to the Section 43 obligation of institutions? And three, breach of Article 10. Now, in relation to, to Varys, I've, I've um, characterised it as, as a, a macro challenge, which is the challenge that this guidance um, somehow elides um, extremism and terrorism. Um, and my learned friend relies in particular on paragraph 19. I'm so sorry. No, I jumped the gun back in. I think you may have read in paragraph 11, but I said, so I jumped the gun. Oh, but apologies. Can, 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 I, can I start with, a, with a, an important proposition in relation to the construction of the guidance? It's in, it's in the Human Rights Act. Um, and it's uh, Authorities Bundle 1 tab 12. <coughs> uh, page, so I want to take the word of relationship to, to section 3 at page AB186.
far as it is possible to do so, primary legislation and subordinate legislation must be read and given effect in a way which is compatible with the Convention rights. The guidance is subordinate legislation for the purposes of, of this provision. The guidance has to be read compatibly with Convention rights. Um, and we find that in section 21 of the Human Rights Act and the definition of subordinate legislation. Uh, so that's at page AB218. Um, and order rules, reg so this is F at the bottom of the page. Subordinate legislation means any order rules, regulations, scheme, warrant, bylaw, or other instrument made under primary legislation. Guidance is, in my submission, plainly a, an instrument made under primary legislation. It's a, it's a it's a means of giving effect to primary legislation. It's it's brought into force by way of regulation, subject to affirmative. And I need, I need, you say that with great confidence. My, my initial reaction to that would be instrument is not a policy word in this country. Well, instrument is to be read consistently. Say, is, that, is, that, is there authority on that? I, I don't know, but I'm slightly surprised to hear what you're saying about that. Is there authority that a policy document of this kind is an instrument for this purpose? Well, it, it, I, I don't have an authority to rely on, but no, I say it's but plainly an instrument. It's not a policy document, it's statutory guidance. So it's made under primary legislation. No, it's made under section 29. It's brought into effect by way of um, regulations. But the power to issue guidance. But maybe this is common. Is this common ground? Let me hear the end of the submission because I'm not. I don't really understand what the submission is. Oh, yes. this is a new, you haven't heard the submission. Before. I'll, I'll wait and see. No, this is a new one. Right. So it's brought into effect under Section 29. Now I say that, Mr. Sanders, simply because I don't know whether I've come across this before in some remote apologize in practice, but, but I, 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 those words are common words, legislative words, and I would be pretty surprised if there wasn't authority on the meaning of instrument in this context. I don't, have you done any research on that? Well, yes, I, there's nothing to say it's confined to um, something in, in the sense of a statutory instrument with an, with an SI number. You know, that may be so. I, I, instrument... Uh, in, my, in my submission, plainly means w w what it says, something that is an instrument for giving effect to the, to the primary legislations. Um, and it, it's obviously a broad class of, of type of document that might be made or issued under primary legislation. Because Are there any instruments specified in the, um, like the term of this sort of whole guidance? Yes, yes, but, but the, the submission I'm going to come on to is that the guidance has to be read uh, compatibly with, with convention rights. The criticism that's made of paragraph 11 is that that may um, lead to or permit or encourage uh, a higher ed education institution to um, cancel or refuse permission to go ahead with an event um, in circumstances where that would be incompatible with Article 10. Um, now, my primary submission is that that's, that's not how this guidance works. It's not guidance as to what outcome you come to when you, when you take a particular decision. It's guidance about how you factor in uh, an, one important consideration. Uh, and that one important consideration may well call for cancellation of an, of an event. Uh, in my submission, it's the circumstances in which... Um, an event um, which uh, risks destroying people into terrorism um, 
cannot be mitigated should nevertheless be allowed to go ahead on university premises. And if it weren't, that would be a breach of Article 10. That, that's a vanishingly slim um, possibility. But in any event, the guidance can't be read in that way because Section 3 of the Human Rights Act prevents it being read in that way. So I'm not about to say that guidance which would otherwise, unless reinterpreted with convention obligations in mind by someone fitted to do it, unless it's read in that particular way, guidance which would be misleading isn't misleading. That's a circular argument. If guidance misstates the obligations or creates an imbalance in understanding of the obligations, the fact that the guidance, if an instrument, has to be read consistently with convention obligations merely proves the point. You can't have guidance that misleads but must be read as if it doesn't mislead because it mustn't mislead. But it, but the final, it, well, that's your submission, really, isn't it? I mean, no, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a... In terms of the, the, the institution reading the guidance, that's a, that's a factor to be borne in mind in terms of their, their construction of it. Somebody in, the HR department, somebody in the HR department of the school has to call in the professor of human rights in order to say, well, how am I supposed to read this? This is what it says. I, 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 we've now seen this case. It's fucked. And now what we have to do is we have to reinterpret it under Section 3. I have no idea what the hell it is. Please tell me. Well, my lord... Is, um, that, is that really what's going to happen? No. Uh, it's not... This isn't something that falls to a person in, in the human resources department in a school. Um, this is something that falls to the to the senior person in a, in a university who is charged with putting together that university's free speech policy under this guidance. Um, I imagine it won't be in any significant case of work its way up to the, vi to the vice chancellor of the university and they'll have to express a view about it. You know, it's, it's big news to cancel meetings. So it'll be on the front page of the newspaper. Anyway, well, look, have you got your submission? Look, we've got your submission. The question is, is, is will really be one of cancellation. It's whether to allow it to go ahead in the first place. Um, but the, the way I would put it this way is, well, what if this is problematic, if the wording of paragraph 11 is problematic and you're not, you, you don't accept the judge's analysis. Um, How much will you accept? Well, uh, as a fallback, I say that's right. I say we don't, we don't need to get into as... As hard you, you haven't got a respondent's notice, have you? No, I haven't. So I mean, you, you have to establish whether or not the judge is right. And the judge says, I read what he says. He says, well, um, the guides may be right or wrong. At the end of the day, you've got a separate duty, and, uh, you, know, and, and uh, you have to make up your own mind. And if you think that this guidance is wrong, you should follow it. You should, you should follow your own your decision. I mean, that's the way he dealt with it. Yes, I mean... Uh, Standing back from it, I say it doesn't need to be put in those terms because following the guidance simply means having regard to this consideration, and that in and of itself doesn't doesn't compel a particular outcome. Um, but as a backstop, that the judge is right, uh, that's reinforced by the reference to the section three um, of the Human Rights Act, um, and to address it this way, if there were a problem, uh, his his his, in his approach doesn't involve Section 3 or 2. Your, your side, if you say having regard to, uh, a, a, to the consideration doesn't preclude a particular outcome, that is a Section 3 point. That's your Section 3 point. Yes, yeah, uh, that's as right. a backstop. Um, that's your Section 3 point. No, but his, his, the judge's approach is simply to say the Secretary of State does this, but you've got your separate duty, and that can trump the guidance if necessary. That, that's not a Section 3 point, is it? No. 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 Um, I mean, the Section 3 point reinforces, but it also points to the, to the same outcome. So the, the, the way I'd put it is this. Um, if, it were, if it were the case that section 11, that paragraph 11 is somehow problematic, what would cure that? Well, it, perhaps a, perhaps a, a, a revised guidance with your wording. Well, but it would just be to say, subject to, uh, as long as you can do this compatibly with your duties under the Human Rights Act, that would be it. And that's what the guidance already says. So if we look at paragraph 5... Well, that wouldn't be guidance. I, mean, how, I don't understand that. Paragraph 11 is absolutely explicit. It says, if any risk remains, 
after any of us would do it, after you have mitigated as much as you can, the, the, the mitigation will take place, as we have said. And um, I mean, we can't get away. We can't get away from that. Well, can, can I first take your logic to, to paragraph five? Yes. Of oh, what? Of the of the, the higher education prevent duty guidance. So compliance with the prevent duty requires that properly thought through procedures and policies are in place. Having procedures and policies in place which match the general expectations set out in this guidance will mean that institutions are well placed to comply with the prevent duty. Compliance will only be achieved if these procedures and policies are properly followed and applied. The guidance does not prescribe what appropriate decisions would be. This will be up to institutions to determine, having considered all the factors of the case. And our submission is the guidance has to be read as a whole. I understand the point about the meaning of paragraph 11, taken on its own, divorced from what the nature of the, uh, the duty to have regard to the guidance is, what the meaning of that, those words is. But the effect of the guidance as a whole in the statutory context is not, in my submission, um, unlawful. And the, the only way in which it could be said to be unlawful is if it permits or encourages or leads to something that's incompatible with Article 10. And, and as I say, that is, is a vanishingly remote prospect. Because what, what one has to have there in that situation, even if not with me on, on how to understand the guidance, if, if one only focuses on paragraph 11. Furthermore, when deciding whether or not to host a particular speaker, RHEDs should consider carefully whether the views being expressed or likely to be expressed constitute extremist views that risk drawing people into terrorism or are shared by terrorist groups. In these circumstances, the event should not be allowed to proceed except where RHEDs are entirely convinced that such risk can be fully mitigated without cancellation of the event. Now, full mitigation We've looked at what mitigation means in this context, and the word mitigation doesn't mean absolute avoidance. It means reduction of the seriousness. Um, so what type of event couldn't be fully mitigated? Well, that's a different well, it's, it, but so it's this, propos this proposition we're now advancing is that the possibility of this unlawful, inverted commas, or potentially unlawful event is so insignificant that it should be ignored. Um, well, I rather thought that what the proposition was that the mitigation of the event is a legitimate limit to the Article 10 rights, so that there actually isn't an interference with free speech because the potential speaker can agree and will be allowed to come and speak provided the conditions are set in place to allow him properly to exercise his freedom. Well, absolutely. Um, yeah, but the, prob the problem you've got, I think, is that should there be a situation, and we, I can't say what it is, and you say it's vanishingly small, but the trouble is with paragraph 11 is that if there is a case where it can't be mitigated, whatever that may be, yes. it can't go ahead. Well, now it may be that in, a, in, a, in 999 cases out of 1,000, it may be possible to mitigate, although that may be a matter of controversy, whether you are mitigating. Issue. Well, the mitigation proposed is quite explicit in paragraph 11. The central point being that speakers with extremist views, by which one takes it must be extremist views capable of having the effect that engages the whole thing in the first place. So, people, speakers with extremist views who could draw people into terrorism are challenged with opposing views as part of the same event. Um, so that the mitigation is having a speaker that opposes those points of view. Now, it, it, that's the way you... Yes, my lord, y yes, and the, the, the point is that um, if you have this, this 
extreme um, hypothetical example of a speech on a university that's going to risk drawing people into terrorism and that can't be mitigated in the way in which mitigation is, uh, mitigation is understood, and you were to simply cancel it following paragraph 11, not looking at the guidance as a whole, it's difficult to see why that wouldn't be a proportionate interference for the purposes of Article 10.2, because it's not preventing the person from expressing that view, it's just preventing them from doing it on university premises, which are, is a publicly funded forum um, where there are young people, potentially vulnerable people, present. Well, that's not the reason of the judge. That's not the reason of the judge. I mean, I, ha I have a, a series of, of fallback positions on this. Um, and I'm content to go with um, the judge's approach, um, but even if Melinda Friend is advancing the proposition that, that that's not right, even if that even if that were the case, cannot see how this paragraph eleven, even if just applied on its own, um, could be said to lead to or encourage um, or permit. Um, decisions which are incompatible with Article 10. With the Article 10 rights of a speaker who can just do the speech somewhere else. Yes. Is that, is that it? Apologies, my lord. We've, we've jumped around a bit and I just want to make sure that it, I haven't missed anything. Um, the, I know you have my our written submissions. Um, I mean, I do understand the structure of ground one, two, of these, as you say, which is violins and the other. But I mean, I think you've got to do that. Uh, I'm grateful, my lord. So the so that's the that's as I term it the the micro challenge, saying paragraph eleven is somehow defective. Not the guidance as a whole, but this paragraph eleven should be qualified in some way. So I've dealt with that. Um, the macro challenge uh, is the idea that somehow the guidance goes too far because it confuses getting drawn into extremism with getting drawn into to terrorism. And I think I'll just simply leave that on the basis that the, the judge was right in his analysis, um, which is at paragraphs 26, 30 to 31, 100, and 135 to 139 of the judgment. This is, this is on the ultra virus point? Right? This is on, on the, the point that um, it, it's ultra virus because yes. it's, it, it's, it's directed to tr people being drawn into extremism rather than people being drawn into terrorism. We say simply that's just a, a, a misconceived challenge. Um, and you've got in our skeleton argument and, and in the, the witness statement of Matthew Collins, um, the, the parts of the guidance that we draw attention to and say need to be had regard to in understanding what it actually means and that the judge deals with what the this in, par in the middle of paragraph 19 what this is a reference to Finally, just before mo moving off from this, just to emphasise, in relation to the guidance, is, is the importance of to whom it is addressed. Um, it's addressed to higher in education institutions, to senior managers. Um, there's the evidence that you have about the training and support that they receive, um, and the way in which they are then guided to proceed is to introduce their own policies. Um, it's not this guidance is not for students. They will obviously refer to local policies. It's not um, for external speakers because that will be dealt with under the local policy. And then there's a, there's a structured system in place for if an issue arises, escalation of the decision making um, so that consideration can be given to mitigation Consideration can be given to consultation with the prevent coordinator. So there will be scope for dialogue and appeal. It's not simply, I'd like to, I'd like to host this event, yes or no, no, that's it. 
That's not how it works. May I just check with my sound team over here? <coughs> Apologies, thank you. I mean, you, 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 I think you swept up everything, including section 31. No, I, ha I haven't, no. So I'm going to deal separately with section 31. It's important to understand what section 31 means and what, you know, like what the section 43 duty is in fact about. Um, so if I could take your Lordships, your Ladyship, to the 2015 Act. So uh, authorities bundle one, tap two. So freedom of expression in universities, um, and under subsection 2, when carrying out the duty imposed by section 26, the specified authority, which will in, for these purposes include higher education institutions, must have particular regard to the duty to ensure freedom of speech if it is subject to that duty. Um, I won't read out the rest of it. And then over the page, subsection 3, is when issuing guidance under section 29 to specified authorities to which this section applies, the Secretary of State must have particular regard to the duty to ensure freedom of speech. Um, and then it continues. And then the, the duty to ensure freedom of speech is defined in subsection 5 as meaning the duty imposed by section 43.1 of the Education Number 2 Act. And the submission I made below, which the judge accepted, is that section 43.1 doesn't go to um, decisions about allowing events to proceed. It is concerned with ensuring that events which are agreed to um, are, are able to continue um, without disruption. And so it's at tab 9 of the same bundle. Section four, so it's AB 155 is the page number. Every individual and body of persons concerned in the government of any establishment to which this section applies shall take such steps as are reasonably practicable to ensure that freedom of speech within the law is secured for members, students, and employees of the establishment and for visiting speakers. Um, the duty imposed by subsection 1 above includes in particular the duty to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the use of any premises of the establishment is not denied to any individual or body or per of persons on any ground connected with uh, the beliefs or the policy or objectives of that body. Um, and then I won't read out the rest of it, but it's, it was accepted by the, the judge and rightly so. But this isn't a provision that goes to decision making about whether and when to allow events. It's a provision that goes to ensuring that if an event is given the go-ahead, um, it can't be disrupted via denial of premises or via um, protests and so on. Forty-three two, the duty imposed by subsection one above includes the duty to ensure that, as far as reasonably practical, the use of any premises of the establishment is not denied. So the use is not denied to any individual on any ground connected. Why doesn't that? Why doesn't forty-three two include somebody who who if, what he wants is free to come? Uh, well, it's 
I can see 43.1 obviously applies to people who are there, but what was it? Why is 43.2 not uh, relevant to the ability of people who some members of the university want to invite to come? Um, th th that's simply not the, 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 the purpose of, of the provision. It's never been understood in that way. The background to it was, in the 1980s, um, primarily conservative politicians going to speak at universities and not being able to give speeches because of uh, left-wing um, opponents making it impossible. And this provision was passed to oblige universities to um, counteract that. It was not and has never been understood as a provision which gives anyone a right to come onto university premises and speak. Well, maybe that's what people have always thought, but I'm just reading it. I mean, the, the, the language is perfectly open. That the duty is to ensure that the use of any premises is not denied. And that's in pursuance of the duty from subsection 1. And the categories of those envisaged ends with visiting speaker. Yes. So someone who is a visiting, someone who's been invited, not someone who just wants to be a visiting speaker, but someone who is a visiting speaker. Yeah, well, that's, but that's covered, I think, by section 43.1 covers, covers visiting speakers. So section 43.2 is something other than that. That's the point. No, it's, it's 43.1 is dealing with people who are on the establishment, that is, people, visiting speakers who are actually visiting the place. Two is, 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 well, I don't know. Anyway, you've got your submission on that. I mean, it's a short one. Well, my Lord, with respect to, it begins, the duty imposed by subsection one above includes. Yeah. Two is, is fleshing out what one... Yes. But one has visiting speakers in mind. Yes. It doesn't say visiting speakers who were, didn't think of coming themselves but were invited by someone on the staff of the university. It's just a visiting speaker. Yes, but you have to be a visiting speaker. And the, the, the question as to whether or not you are a visiting speaker, have you been invited, is this event going ahead, is, a, is an antecedent question. And, and, and I mean, it's, it, this isn't simply, this is accepted by the judge. Um, I've referred to the decision, of, the decision of the Divisional Court in Caesar Gordon, um, the judgment of Lord, Ju Lord Justice Watkins on this, um, and I mean, it may be that I should take your lordships in re relationship to these in order to make, make this good, uh, if it's to be controversial. Oh, is, it, is it controversial? It's definitely controversial. It's definitely controversial. Well, authorities bundle two. slightly odd, isn't it, when you think about it, because the section 31.3 was specifically aimed at guidance to be issued. And that guidance is dealing with people, is it not, who are to be invited? Well, no, the, 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 gu the guidance, the prevent duty guidance, um, is to deal with, not solely in relation to external speakers, but in relation to um, anything that may be happening in the institution. No, no, but, but if you're right about the reference in section 31.3 to the um, uh, 1986 Act, if you're right about that, then, then in, in, in issuing paragraph 11 of the guidance, that had nothing to do with section 131 at all. Section 131 might apply to others, but not to that at all. It just doesn't apply to that. Is that that's your submission? Uh, what? Okay, it sort of comes in and out of the guidance of section 31 Yes, because the, the sec all, all that the Secretary of State is required to do by section 31.3 is have particular regard to that duty when formulating the guidance. And she has a particular regard to it. It's referred to in the guidance. It's a, it's, a, it's a slightly separate issue to deciding whether or not to allow events to proceed, but it's, it's relevant because it's to do with 
um, ensuring that they can proceed. Um, okay, which, 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 which case do you want us to look at? So it's the R and uh, Liverpool University ex parte Caesar Gordon. Which, which tab is that? <clears throat> tab 30 of Authorities Bundle 30. 2. Uh, and if I could just stop, start with the, the head note, which is so page A, B, 10, 43. Uh, I'm grateful. Um, and then it's the, ju the judgment of uh, Lord Justice Watkins giving the judgment of the court um, at page 131 G to 132 B AB 105L. So in our opinion, the words reasonably practicable qualify the steps which must be taken to ensure freedom of speech. The extent of that duty is made clear by subsections 3 and 4, which define the manner in which the duty imposed by section 1 is to be discharged. The governing body of the university is required to issue a code of practice to be followed by members of the university in connection with the organisation of meetings and other activities held on the premises of the university. And the governing body of the university must take such steps as are reasonably practicable to secure that the requirements of the code of practice, which apply to its members on its premises, are complied with. The emphasis is ours. Thus we conclude that on a true construction of section 43, the duty imposed on the university by subsection 1 is local to the members of the university and its premises. Its duty is to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that those whom it may control, that is to say its members, students, and employees, do not prevent the exercise of freedom of speech within the law by other members, students, and employees, and by visiting speakers in places under its control. We require the university in the discharge of its duty under subsection 1 to take into consideration persons who take the service that's Really and that was thought of duty. What steps we should take as regard as regard disorder outside the university? Yes, but in terms of what what what's done on the university, that's that's the concern and the focus of section forty three. Yeah. It's not a more general um, entitlement on people to come in and give speeches on university premises. Um, that that's a that's a matter for the university. Um, and if I can just. Um, take your lordship's relationship to, to one further document to support this. It's in um, volume three, so the second supplementary binder. Uh, and then it's, a, it's tab E4E. So page E729. So it's the third bundle three. Yes. I'm sorry, this is not authority three. No. What was the page number again? Uh, e729. Yeah. UK parliamentary briefing, uh, freedom of speech on campus, and it's just to, to, to make the point that the, the understanding of Universities UK accords with mine and accords with the judges when it comes to, to section 43. So paragraph 4, 
for talking about Section 43. This duty clearly does not extend to a requirement to issue invitations to particular speakers. Rather, it is concerned with ensuring that invited speakers are able to attend and address the intended audience. Also are able to attend. Yes, invited speakers are able to attend. So it, uh, uh, someone who's been invited to come and speak isn't blocked from getting onto the platform by people opposed to their views. And then paragraph 26. A Universities UK is opposed to no platform policies where these seek to bar lawful free speech. But at the same time, it should remain open to a student union as it is in any other corporate body of people, to decline to invite a person to address that body of people or a subsidiary part of it, and to rescind the invitations that have been given. We do not think that it is the intention of the 1986 Act that a right to free speech on campus should extend to a right to being, to being granted an invitation to speak on campus. So the question in relation to this, this ground is, has the, the Secretary of State in issuing the guidance failed to have particular regard to the, the Section 43 duty on, on universities? Um, and it, it, the Section 43 duty is, is mentioned in the guidance. Um, it's clearly been had regard to. And there is nothing in the guidance which is incompatible with or inconsistent with the Section 43 duty or that suggests it could be used to... Um, imply that the Section 43 duty wasn't the, the subject of consideration by the Secretary of State. And so we say that the judge's finding on that was, was correct. Yes. But, well, was that, um, uh, concludes that ground. So now ground three, uh, which is the final ground for me to, to address your Lordship's on, which is our The position basically is that due to matters, uh, other matters, uh, we actually have to finish this case today. And so that, as matters have turned out, that is now required. And so we will sit as long as is necessary to do that. It's not convenient for anybody, but that's how matters have now fallen. And so we now just need to make sure that the court itself can actually do that. So we're going to rise for five minutes to make sure that can happen. Oh, look, before you rise can I make a suggestion if it, it's any help that I'd be pa content to put in a written reply rather than take up time this afternoon I can look at that but normally we did thank you for the offer very much we appreciate that Mr. Ben. we'll consider that but uh, uh, ex ex bitter experience over many years on the part of all judges that once that happens it doesn't just stop the, the cooperation in any way we'll see all right